is Virginia Sanchez. I want to welcome you to Connecting with the Truths of the Espinoza Saga. This is a presentation um, presented by myself, Virginia Sanchez, Matt Lopez, and History Colorado curator James Peterson. I will talk about the new research into the Southern Colorado and the Espinozas during the early period of the Colorado Territory. 1861 to 1863. And Matt will introduce the uh, donor of the uh, artifacts attributed to the Espinozas, and James Peterson will discuss the acquisition of the artifacts. We invite you to come down to the um, History Colorado Center to see these artifacts uh, for yourself, and uh, that'll help you decide what is true about the Espinozas and what is not true. So what I intend to do in my presentation of the violent killing of the Espinosas is to review the events and provide an alternative explanation about what was happening during the time period that made Colorado so violent and um, why this collective violence occurred against the Espinosas. The Espinosas refer to two brothers, Felipe and Vivian, and a supposed nephew by the name of Vicente. For some reason, these three were uh, specifically identified as the murderers of up to 32 people throughout Colorado. And it's an astounding story, um, lots of rumors, uh, lots of conjecture. And so here we try to put some things in order um, so that you, know, you have some information and you can decide the truth. This research led to my book, Pleas and Petitions, and um, it's, a, it's a book that's uh, encompassing all of territorial Colorado and it does include the story of the Espinosa brothers. Territory was created in, uh, by February 28, 1861. However, Congress had been deciding about Colorado Territory years before this. Now, um, Congress had decided that it wanted a square area in the middle of the United States map, and uh, they wanted this square area to be the new territory. So what they decided to do was to automatically take land from Nebraska Territory, uh, Utah Territory, Kansas, and New Mexico Territory. When uh, they took area from New Mexico Territory, 7,000 people and the land automatically transferred into Colorado. So one morning, the Hispanos there, they were also um, Catholic and Spanish speaking, rich in custom and ties of ancestry to New Mexico. They woke up one morning and decided, well, not decided because they had no vote, but they woke up one morning and they were in a new area, new Colorado territory. And this territory would now be run by Anglo Protestants and they would, and these Hispanos would have to follow under that type of order. So it was very difficult for them. We find that um, uh, we find that they uh, weren't accustomed to having to travel to Denver to do their uh, business, uh, legal business, and uh, actually it was closer to Taos and to Santa Fe than it was to any parts of Denver. So this gives an idea of what was happening during the time. We've got the Civil War that was started in 1861. So we've got a lot of military movement um, in southern Colorado due to Fort Garland. Now, the military was recruiting for soldiers. Um, and then we have Major Archibald Gillespie from the New Mexico district who comes in and does a military census of the Conejos area. Now Conejos is an area that's in 
southern Colorado. Uh, Conejos is both the, the town area as well as the county. So uh, you'll see that in a, a map a little bit later. But anyway, um, so Conejos seems to be a hotbed of a lot of, uh, of activity happening, both with the military, uh, Fort Garland in nearby Costilla County, and then we've got new territorial laws that are being passed. Now at the legislature, everything is held uh, in English, and um, they're passing new taxes and, and new fines. However, the laws are not being published in Spanish, so the Hispanos are having a hard time understanding what the new fines include and what the taxes, what's, what the tax money will go toward. So it's already some tension there with that type of, of uh, uh, structure. On the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see that there's competition for land. Now, this was Ute country, and the Utes are still trying to hang on to their land as well as um, trying to get food. I mean, the, the resources are now taken up by new settlers and miners who are coming in. So the, the Utes are having a hard time. Then you've got the Espanos who were automatically moved into Colorado Territory. They live on the Conejos land grant. Now they're competing for the land because they're trying to retain their land grant and they go through several um, uh, processes so that they can get their land grant confirmed by Congress. And during this territorial period, the land grant does not get confirmed yet and nor does it in the future, which really impacts those Hispanos and their, their land. We find that we have a lot of um, squatters coming in. And so um, we've got that kind of competition for the land. In addition, we have new miners coming in. Now of the new miners, um, the territorial justice once said that uh, they were trying to avoid conscription in their own states and that they were the cause of the many problems that were occurring in, in Colorado at the time. <clears throat> As I mentioned, the Espinosa brothers, Vivian and Felipe, were accused of uh, killing up to 32 people. Well, the governor, Governor Evans, John Evans, had decided that he wanted something done, and he asked for, uh, uh, he asked his U.S. Marshal to do something about it, bring him in dead or alive. So the U.S. Marshal had uh, a couple of sentences printed in the newspaper and it simply read Roban and Felipe Ospinencia, couldn't even spell their names. And this is the only description of the Espinosas. Felipe was the one that was six feet, excuse me, five feet, six inches tall. He was slender and um, Vivian was shorter and heavier. At this time, there was no photography that was invented and so um, we don't have a description or photographs of the Espinosa. So that's important to remember as we go through this presentation. So this is the only description of the Espinosas. The other description that was used for them was simply they were Mexican. Now, we find that um, after the U.S. war with Mexico, that by the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, uh, Hispanos who were, were living on ceded land automatically became U.S. citizens, and they were considered white by race. So those are two important uh, messages to remember as we're going forward with this, because a lot of times the newspaper would refer to Hispanos as Mexican, both to question their citizenship and um, their um, um, to question their leadership and their patriotism. This is a map that um, I quickly drew. In the lower half of the left-hand corner, you'll see the Conejos area. We've got the Conejos River, Conejos Canyon, and then further along, we've got Conejos in the San Rafael district. You see the sand dunes and Mount Blanca and Fort Garland in the center. Now up toward the upper right-hand corner, you'll see these areas near Breckenridge, uh, Leadville, and um, Colorado City and Pueblo on the right. Now what I'm trying to do on this map is to designate uh, at least seven areas where 
the Espinosas were attributed to murdering um, some people. Now, um, from the Conejos area, you'll see that it's a long distance over the mountain passes to get up into the mining district. So um, the purple area, I show where the mileage is just straight from Conejos to Port Garland and then Port Garland to Trinidad. And then I show some mileage in the uh, going um, or, uh, vertically um, to Pueblo and Colorado City, and you'll see that that's, that's a long distance. We have 85 miles and then another 26 just to get to Colorado City. Now that's just straight driving. So there were no roads at the time. So you have to imagine that there, um, Espinosas, in order to commit these murder, murders, are having to cross mountain passages. And um, this is all while eluding um, the mobs that are searching for them, the posses that are created to search for them, as well as the soldiers that are looking for them. Uh, so it, it's ironic that you can um, see the distance and one murder would be one day and then they'd be somewhere else another day and commit another error, uh, another murder. So I want you to really kind of understand that that's a long distance. And um, some of the artifacts that are attributed to the Espinosas include um, some spurs. And if you're running, you cannot wear spurs and run at the same time. So um, that's another uh, questionable thing in my mind as far as what was really happening to the Espinosas at this time. The, uh, I know you can't see the key here, but the areas in yellow indicate the uh, sites where the Espinosas were said to have committed some murders. And the purple area includes the um, mileage area. Archibald Gillespie was a major in the New Mexico military district from Santa Fe. And he was ordered to do a military census of the Conejos area. So he came into the Conejos and he divided the areas into several districts. San Rafael happens to be one of the districts that he divided it into. And the Espinosa brothers lived within the San Rafael district in the town called San Judas de Tadeo. So in 1863, Archibald Gillespie then did this um, census where he found 84 men who were of conscription age. So in other words, these men were um, uh, eligible to be enrolled into the U.S. Army for service in the uh, U.S. Civil War. Now among these 84 men, he only found 21 pounds of powder. What's interesting is on the right you'll see that the majority of their weapons were muskets. There were 13 muskets. Now a musket is a very old um, uh, uh, form of rifle and uh, it needed musket balls. It didn't take powder or uh, bullets. So moving up the chart, then we see that they had three working rifles, five working carbines, five pistols, five shotguns, and 13 working muskets. Now, if we go into the San Judas de Tadeo area, um, and this is from Major Archibald Gillespie's census, we find that it lists the Espinosa brothers living in this area. Now, what I'm trying to show in this screen is that um, their ages and the arms that they owned and recorded. So Felipe, 38, owned one carbine and only a half a pound of ammunition. Vivian, 30 years old, owned no arms and ammunition. Now, you know, we have to understand that is this uh, a true indication of uh, what they owned? Um, and this is all that we have recorded. Um, and so we see that their neighbors are in the same position. Um, they're of enlistment age, except for Juan Antonio Suazo, who is 70. And um, let's see, among these men then, only Jesus Maria Sanchez down here uh, owns two pistols. Another one owns a rifle, but only a pound of ammunition. 
for the whole San Judas de Tadeo Plaza area, there was only 2.5 pounds of ammunition. Um, it's interesting to note that Major Gillespie also wanted to know how much uh, cultivated land the people owned, um, uh, what type of livestock and uh, crops they grew, and um, uh, how, ma how many arms and ammunition they had. And this was all so that these items could be conscripted if needed if the uh, Confederate forces came into Colorado. Let me find my place here. It's interesting, too, that uh, Major Archibald Gillespie wrote to headquarters that the women of San Judas de Tadeo were mostly in rags, I'm going to read this, very dirty and presented the lowest class of poverty to a sad degree. Some women were abusive, suspicious, and disrespectful, disrespectful to public authorities. The people there were notoriously bad and lawless, but Major Archibald fails to give us specific details, so we don't know why he thinks that they're uh, notoriously bad and lawless. Is this this rumor and conjecture? We don't know. Um, unfortunately, these are the types of records we're working with at this time. Again, there were no photographs, um, and we're lucky to find this uh, military census that he has brought forward. Now, when When the governor ordered their arrest, um, there's a Major Nicholas Holt from Fort Garland who arrived at the Espinosa home. Now Viviana Espinosa met him at the door but quickly back into the house. And according to the newspaper, the brothers broke through a wall, gathered arms, guns, pistols, and bows and arrows and made a rush out the door while discharging a shower of arrows. You cannot discharge your bow while holding on to arms and ammunition. So, um, you know, I, I've kept asking myself, okay, well, let's take a look at this uh, uh, bows and arrows description. <clears throat> and I found that the people of Southern Colorado were still using bows and arrows because they lacked uh, sufficient arms and ammunition. So, um, after the escape, Major Holt then confiscated the items from the Espinosa home. Now, the home was a, a log home, so a hakal, and he put the house on fire, thus leaving the Espinosa family um, without a home, without any bedding, and without any clothing and food. Now, Felipe had two children, ages five and eight. So, um, after tracking and finding the Espinosa camp, John McCannon, who um, had put a posse of miners together, ordered his sharpshooter to shoot. The shot had blown off the face of Vivian, instantly killing him. And as the miners ran toward Vivian, they kept shooting into his body. So um, uh, that's kind of hard to, hard to imagine because if they could have taken him in alive and he could have you know, uh, use the due process of the law, we could have figured out whether these murders definitely were attributed to them, um, and that had been attributed to them, were occurred by them. So McCannon reportedly found some gold dust in Vivian's pocket. So it leads us to believe that perhaps the Espinosa brothers stumbled onto the California Gulch gold mine and disrupted the miners, or there was some altercation with the miners. But according, but historical records don't tell us this information. Um, so we just have the rumors and the conjecture that, yeah, they did this killing and they had all of this gold on them and on and on. Um, I also wanted to mention that they had no real description of the Espinosas. Remember, one is five foot six, the other is a little heavier. So how did the McCann uh, mob really know that they were firing into an Espinosa camp? These are the continuous questions that unfortunately can't be remembered. And uh, now then, Felipe and Vicente had escaped from the camp 
when um, Vivian was shot in the face. So then here comes Tom Tobin, who was a tracker, and he tracked down Felipe and Vicente. And um, the uh, incidents leading to him finding the uh, camp is quite interesting, and you'll have to read about that. Um, but anyway, he caught the two and killed and beheaded them. And he later uh, arrived in Fort, Col Fort Garland with the severed heads. <clears throat> Now, diaries were picked up from the Espinosas at the different various camps, and uh, since now, uh, since over time, those diaries have disappeared, there's only rumor about what has happened to the uh, severed heads, and um, today we don't even know where the skulls are at. And it's unfortunate because the family had no body to bury. The Catholic Church could not do a burial, a, sa a sacrament of the burial, um, at that time because there was no intact body. And so there's the family's left with no closure and um, uh, this devastating um, blot on their family name. Um, so were the Espinosas responsible for any and all of these murders? It's interesting because in 1862, one year before they were killed, Vivian and his mother served as a godparent, uh, godparents to an infant who was born in a neighboring village. Now, by Hispano custom, you would not invite or ask someone who was immoral to be a godparent to your child. And this was because of the principle of trust and respect, uh, uh, co-parenthood, and um, those types of things. So that it's good. That um, church record gives us a little indication of what uh, Vivian was like. Now, as far as Felipe, he was rumored to be abusive and to have kidnapped his future wife. Again, those are just rumors and conjecture. So, um, with regard to the written documents, so we know that the Espinosos were literate in Spanish, and they could write in Spanish, and um, but no Spanish speakers ever saw the written or the translated documents. These, the Anglo's um, had attempted to translate these Spanish documents on their own, and I think that a lot of times they misunderstood the. Uh, poetics of what the Espinosas were really trying to say. Um, and as I mentioned, their pickled heads have since disappeared. So were the Espinosas responsible for any or all of these murders? Until documents um, and reported diaries resurface, we will never know. And although I have not exposed a smoking gun, the newly documented evidence from the oral histories, the military documents, and enacted laws of the time attest that Anglo power, privilege, and oppression negatively impacted the Espano settlers in Southern Colorado. And I believe that the Espinosas were caught in the middle. Here's James Peterson and Matt Lopez. In February, 1943, the Colorado Historical Society received a donation of five objects from the family of Colorado pioneer Leopold Meyer. The donation consisted of an assortment of objects, including a Spanish colonial rawhide trunk, 1861 Colt Navy revolver, pair of Spanish-style spurs, pair of leather chaps, Arapaho Indian moccasins, and a braided leather cord. Meyer, a Jewish immigrant, was born in 1839 in Alsace-Lorraine, then a territory of the German Empire. Arriving in New York at the age of nine with only one relative in the U.S., an aunt. According to his great-grandson, Andrew Selig, he left New York and sold matches on the street corners of Lafayette, Indiana. Having no education due to having to work till he was 18, Meyer envisioned a great life of adventure and fortune. He, like many spirited young men of the time, made his way west via the Mississippi River. After arriving in St. Louis, he ventured to Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, the jumping-off place to the west. Fearing Indian attacks and buffalo stampedes, Leopold walked alongside the ox-drawn wagon teams for 60 days on the 600-mile journey to the front range of Colorado. 
The 20-year-old Meyer arrived in Denver in 1859, then only a small settlement consisting mostly of Native Americans at the confluence of Cherry Creek and the Platte River. Upon arriving in the West, Meyer was a self-made man if there ever was one. Having established himself in various ventures, Leopold dabbled in mining, freighting, mercantile sales, cattle ranching, politics, as well as being the founder and the president of the Swatch County Bank, one of the first in the Rockies. In the June 1907 edition of the Sons of Colorado magazine, an advertisement was ran for the American Furniture Company, located at 1542 Lawrence Street in Denver. A dapper gentleman in the ad points at the reader with the stern gaze stating, Your credit is good. The owner of the American Furniture Company was Adolf Meyer, the son of Leopold. On page 28 of the magazine is a reminiscence article titled, The Death of Espinoza. It was authored by no other than Leopold Meyer. By 1907, he had come a long way from the boy selling matches on the streets of Indiana. He had established himself as one of Colorado's movers and shakers, having already been elected to serve on the first city council of Denver in 1861 at the age of 22. In the article, Leopold recounts a version of the 1864 crime spree of three Nuevo Mexicano bandits who were said to have been engaged in horse rustling, robbery, torture, and a fierce murdering spree. Espinoza gang, comprised of Felipe Nerio, Jose Vivian, and a supposed nephew by the name of Jose Vicente. The Espinozas were American citizens from a Nuevo Mexicano family of mestizo heritage. By 1863, their family had settled in the hamlet of San Rafael, located near present-day Antonito, in the San Luis Valley of south-central Colorado. Having been part of the Spanish Empire, Mexican Republic, New Mexico, and as of 1861, San Rafael was now part of the newly formed Colorado Territory. The Espinoza's ancestral homeland was El Rito, New Mexico, located approximately 72 miles to the southwest of San Rafael. The years following the Mexican-American War brought New Mexicans adversity through the loss of land and political exploitations by Anglo-Americans. Many struggled to adapt to American ways. For others, it proved extremely challenging. Writing in a first-person narrative, Leopold claims to have been in the room at the moment the decapitated heads of the Espinozas were presented to the commanding officer of Fort Garland. The article states, After killing Espinoza, Mr. Tobin, some of the officers, and myself all came to Denver. Mr. Tobin expecting his $1,500. In 1897, 30 years after the affair, Tobin corroborated Leopold's story, stating, I got back to Fort Garland with the heads of the two assassins in a gunny sack. I rolled them out at Colonel Tappan's feet. Mr. Leopold Meyer, whose headquarters are in Denver, was present when I delivered the heads to Colonel Tappan. Having been ordered from Fort Garland to San Rafael, a small army detachment was led by Lieutenant Nicholas Hote and six Hispanic soldiers of the 1st New Mexico Volunteer Regiment. Its commanding officer was the infamous Christopher Kit Carson. After a brief verbal argument at the Espinosa residence, a shootout ensued, with a crossfire of bullets and arrows flying through the air. The Espinosa brothers disappeared into the San Luis Valley, becoming fugitives for the rest of their days. Once the smoke cleared and casualties were assessed, it was reported that the only military death that day was Corporal Desiderio Abeta. Lieutenant Hote, ordered his men to confiscate all of the personal belongings of the Espinoza family household. The seized items included various household implements to include a beaver trap, cooking utensils, and a trunk. Two auctions were held in which these items went to the highest bidder, instantly making them curios and novelties. It is through these auctions that the trunk possibly came into the possession of Meyer. The proceeds from these auctions were used to cover the funeral expenses of Corporal Abeda and reimbursement to the U.S. Army for the cost of the mission. At the end of Meyer's article, he invites the reader and potential customers to see the trunk on display in his son's furniture store. A spectacle for sure. When the donation from Meyer's estate 
was received at the Colorado Historical Society in 1943, the objects were housed in a Pitaka Spanish colonial trunk. It is constructed from a wooden box frame, accented in red bayeta trade cloth, rawhide, fur, and adorned with iron hardware. This ornate style of strong box was made in the northern Mexico state of Chihuahua and was primarily available only to the wealthy. Recent study into these objects have called into question the provenance of the Leopold Meyer collection. Were all of the objects that were housed in the Pataka trunk associated with the Espinosas? Could the Espinosa family have been in possession of such a fancy Pataka trunk at the time of the army raid? Was the trunk stolen bounty from one of their victims? Was the Navy pistol a part of this Wild West saga? These are only a few questions that these objects have brought about. It is doubtful if we will ever know the truth, but better understanding of the people, places, and times can help us uncover these mysteries. If you wish to see a part of the Espinosa collection, please visit History Colorado Center's 100 Objects exhibit. On display are two pistols said to have also belonged to the Espinosas and used during their season of terror. You can also search the History Colorado website to investigate all of these objects and more. Hi everyone. Thank you again for tuning into our presentation today. I am James Peterson, Assistant Curator for Artifacts at History Colorado. I am going to tell you what we know about the provenance of artifacts in our collection attributed to Felipe, Vivian, or Vicente Espinosa. If you are watching this as a precursor to our presentation on April 28th, get your pen and paper ready. You're probably going to want to take some notes. Let me give you some quick background. History Colorado was founded by the state legislature in 1879. We've gone through numerous name changes. We've been the State Historical and Natural History Society, the State Museum, the Colorado History Museum, the Colorado Historical Society, and most recently, History Colorado. During our infancy, the Rocky Mountain News published many articles about recent donations to the museum. As you see here, on April 27, 1897, they printed this short blurb stating that W. D. Todd presented to the State Historical Society a revolver that had been the property of the Desperado Espinosa. No speculation is made regarding which of the three Desperados the gun might have been used by. The notation further states, though, that Mr. Todd received the gun from a Charles Mullen the previous year. And here is the weapon, a 44 caliber Colt Army Model 1860 revolver. Not mentioned in the news article is the leather flap holster the gun was donated with. In the infancy of the museum profession, few means were available to determine the authenticity of historical artifacts. The world was not at the tip of your fingers as it is today, and historical artifacts were quite often accepted purely on claims made about them by the donors. Unfortunately, those claims were not always accurate. Today, it is our responsibility to do our best to try to confirm the authenticity of the artifacts that we collect, preserve, interpret, and display. So let's look at what we have recently been able to confirm about the provenance of this revolver and holster, as well as other artifacts attributed to the Espinosas. We've already seen the Rocky Mountain News article that the donor W. D. Todd received the gun from a Charles Mullen. But how did Charles Mullen obtain it? When, where, why, and from whom did he receive it? This Rocky Mountain News article is, to date, the only reference that we've been able to locate. To paraphrase the article, in 1867, Charles Mullen discovered what was referred to as the 1040 Silver Load at Buckskin Joe. The Buckskin Joe mining camp was in the heart of mining activity in the upper section of South Park and within shouting distance of the site of one of the killings attributed to 
Felipe and Vivian Espinoza, that of Bill Carter, on Saturday, April 25th, 1863. That still leaves a lot of questions unanswered, but it does lend some credence to Mullins's claim. Interestingly, the next donation of an artifact attributed to the Espinosas came 22 years after the first, and again by the same donor, W. D. Todd, identified on this catalog card as William D. Todd. This is what we refer to as a donor card. Up until the early 1980s, everything donated by a single donor would be recorded on a donor card. Besides the two revolvers recorded on William Todd's card, you'll notice several fraternal organization pins and badges. This is another clue to determining who W.D. Todd was, what his interest in the Espinosas was, as well as why he was making donations to the museum. It was actually not difficult to find information about William David Todd. In fact, there is a portrait of him on one of the walls in our building leading into the administration offices. William Todd came to Denver in 1868. He was the confidential secretary to Shiler Colfax, the territorial governor at that time. He was elected to the state legislature in 1879. That very same year, 1879, he introduced the bill that created the State Historical and Natural History Society, our museum. And he was then our treasurer for over 30 years. Additionally, interestingly enough, he was the ancient free and accepted Masons Union Lodge No. 7, Grand Master in 1888. That is him, front row center. Make a note of the man in the second row to his left, Harper M. Orahood. His name will come up again later. Our next donation associated with the Espinosas was the old Spanish trunk donated in 1943 by Adolf Meyer son of the Leopold Meyer that Matt Lopez has already spoken about. Just a couple of things about this donation that I want to note before moving on. This catalog card is the perfect example of what I was speaking about earlier when I said numbering methods and systems had evolved over the lifetime of the institution, often creating more confusion than good. The entire Meyer collection was originally assigned the accession number H1582. Sometime later, some of the contents received additional catalog numbers. That is what the HC and HA numbers that you see to the right are. At some point, it was recognized that the H52 accession number had also been assigned to another donation. In this case, it was a set of unrelated photographs. To remedy the situation, individual components of the Meyer donation were assigned new accession numbers, H3066 through H3068. The moccasins were assigned an E number. The E stands for ethnography. The trunk itself was not physically marked with the new number, so at some time, when somebody saw the number on the trunk still reading H1582, they decided that this was a duplicate accession number and they renumbered it D.H1582, duplicate number H1552. In all of this confusion, no storage location was ever recorded for the moccasins or the leather thong. They never were physically marked with any number, and because the physical descriptions of each given at the time they were donated were so inadequate, we have no idea whether they are still in the collection, and if so, how to identify them and reconnect them to their provenance. To my knowledge, outside of the trunk, the pitaka, we have never attributed any of the other components of this donation to the Espinosas. 
not the revolver, the chapeletas, mocks, revolver, or spurs. It's just not clear from the documentation we have if these objects were in the trunk when it was donated or if they were outside of the trunk. I do want to point out the spurs though. When Vivian Espinoza was killed, the man who first shot him, Joseph Lamb, is said to have removed and taken Vivian's spurs from his feet. He sold the spurs to a judge whose son later donated them to the Pioneer Museum in Colorado Springs. The picture on this slide is one of those spurs. You'll notice the similarities in the styles between the spurs in the Pioneer Museum's collection versus the spurs that were donated to us by Adolf Meyer. They certainly are similar, raising the possibility that they might have been at the Espinosa home when it was raided after Vivian and Felipe had gone into hiding. Another 11 years passed before in 1954, we received the next donation attributed to the Espinosas. After John McCannon's California Gulch Posse ambushed the, the Espinosas on May 9, 1863, killing Vivian Espinosa, the Posse rested in the brothers' abandoned campsite, nibbling on beaver tail that found simmering in a kettle over the brothers' campfire. If you can read the letter to the right on this slide, Bonnie V. Parker writes that her great-grandfather, Levi Booth, was a member of the McCannon Posse and that this is that kettle that contained the beaver tail. I've been told that Booth was one of the McCannon Posse members, but have not found any evidence to confirm that myself. He did, however, run a store and the post office in California Gulch, which is two miles west of Leadville, for two years prior to buying and settling at his historic four-mile house in Denver in the spring of 1864. The kettle is beat up and worn, as you can see by the picture, but over 90 years had passed from the time it was alleged to have been collected until the time it was deposited with the museum. No telling how it was used during that time. According to co-presenter Virginia Sanchez, after Vivian Espinosa had been killed, John McCannon found a small red beaded buckskin bag around Vivian's neck. Inside the bag was an oval shaped gold medal commemorating the miracle of the Virgin of Guadalupe. In 1964, family descendants of John McCannon donated the medal to History Colorado. This is the last donation of any artifacts in our collection that is attributed to the Espinosas. As you can see in this slide, according to the accession record, it was attached to a red buckskin thong covered with red beads. The previously cited bag is not recorded as part of the donation. The medal was then stolen while on display less than one year later in January 1965, leaving only this four bead section of the original buckskin thong. Security in 1965 was unfortunately not what it is now, and especially in Fort Garland where it was stolen from. Now remember when I showed you the 1903 photograph of the Mason Grandmasters? I pointed out the gentleman to William Todd's upper left. This is the gentleman I'm referring to here. This is Harper M. Orohood again. Now, here is a photograph made about 39 years earlier in 1864. The man on the far right is Harper M. Orohood. The man in the center is Captain John McCannon. The year after the Espinosa killings, both men were officers in the 3rd Colorado Cavalry, the Bloody Third at the Sand Creek Massacre, another dark page out of Colorado history where some, quote, souvenirs were collected by the Bloody Third and found their way into History Colorado collections. And again, 
Harpim Orohood was a grandmaster, connecting him to William D. Todd and also to John McCannon. However, coincidentally, we recently found in our records the letter displayed here. The letter was sent in 1899 when the museum first opened its doors to the public to the first curator, Will Farrell. Calvin Haynes, a prospector, mining operator, and attorney in Whitehorn, Colorado, offers to sell to the museum what he claims he can prove is what is left of Vivian Espinosa's skull. We have found no further correspondence in our collection with Mr. Haynes, nor do we have any records that would indicate that we ever received or purchased a skull or anything else from Mr. Haynes. I want to end by saying that history is not stuck in the past. The more curators work with artifacts from the permanent collection, the more we engage the public, the more we uncover, discover, and learn. Thank you.